Chapter 5 Corner woke. He'd had the dream again. The dream of meeting the green man in Vietnam still chilled his blood. He remembered too well that night, the stench of tropic decay mixed with salty air off the South China Sea, breezes rattling and outcropping of banana trees as he sat alone around a low fire. He was en route to the DMZ to engage with the NVA regulars in a real war instead of the dirty guerrilla body count in this Quang Nai province when business had sidetracked him. People of this province were a coarser and fiercer bunch than the more intellectual revolutionaries he'd met in the Iron Triangle. He knew they had been fighting here 30 years for independence. HQ gave the all clear for the sector. He and a platoon of GIs were bivouacked within a perimeter of electronic sensors set to detect as much as a mosquito fart. They had been sampling some of his latest inventory, hypnotized by some tracer fire to the north, but otherwise enjoying a rare, quiet evening. The others had retired while he gazed transfixed at the stars. The next thing he remembered, an overwhelming, sickening stink growing as bold, cold fingers grazed the back of his neck, reaching inside his shirt, squeezing his belly. There beside him, an amphibious creature smiled with yellow teeth, rancid breath, and rubbery green skin. Charlie coming, he said with a hoarse growl. His hooded eyes ate into corner until finally he broke the grip and radioed a nearby gunboat that lit the plane. Twenty NVA regulars were tagged in the firefight that ensued. We were dog meat till you came along, he said to no one in particular. The green man seemed to live just at the edge of his awareness, like a second skin, too close ever for comfort. Corner still wore his Saigon bracelet, a loop of welded Huey rotor chain dangling around his wrist for protection, if not against, then for the green man. Christina Shaughnessy removed the plastic lid from the takeout cup of herb tea, cursing her decision to quit caffeine. She pulled back her auburn hair as she stared at the transparency on the light table through the jeweler's loop. She thought of the dark one and wondered what demons danced in his head. Her lips remembered the pressure of his unexpected kiss, her knuckles burning from the punch. Every man she had known confused her, even her father. Matthew had waited until he was on his deathbed to tell her about his initiation into John Stone Warren's world order. Brutish but brilliant, less human, more like a manufactured being made of silicon and oil stone. We were 28 years behind the German chemical and rocket engineers at the end of World War II. Warren's a realist. Those Nazis would enlist with the Russians, their avowed enemies, just to have a government to fund their programs. It's a ruthless, dog-eat-dog world, sweetheart. We recruited them. Do I regret my affiliation with Warren? Nobody then could have foreseen the growth of the cancer from pursuing those damn Nazis in the national security state we've become. What happens when we try to save democracy by unleashing a nuclear holocaust. Just don't confuse ideology or morality with money. You say your prayers for old dad. I'm heading on upstairs. Then he died. Christina felt his soul merge with hers. She knew Warren had engineered Matthew's exposure to radiation when he was with the Manhattan Project decades before her birth. The experiment was an attempt to accelerate the human capacity for morphogenesis, the power to alter structures in the evolution of an organism. She now understood this capacity as epigenetics, self-switching genes on, off, or off, on, wondered at her rapid expansion of consciousness, an expansion made possible by an intent of living in the present future orientation free of long-term memory neutralized by the radiation. Allowing her eyes as finding a free, a being seen in the eve ray radiating a unknown, 
a Psyhole power of a knowing out of any mirrored why now infinite Psyance potential in a space and time now anybody, etc. Amazing the possibilities when not casting out his thoughts of past history to blockade the road ahead. Asking of it why now as zany, measly, withered, lacking, thinking of it as she cultivated the motto, leave it as too disappearing in the rear view of you mirrored. Christina stayed abreast of Warren's scientific research through an old friend of her father's. She learned about his interest in a bewildering multidisciplinary maze of genetics, quantum physics, bioacoustics, electrochemistry, brainwave entrainment, and nanotechnology. She knew her father's first wife died in pregnancy, possibly due to the fetus being formed soon after his radiation. Thirty years later, he met Sarah and Christina was born. She was in grade school when she first remembered meeting Warren. He was a frequent caller and seemed always to have some hold over her dad. She looked at the transparency. The mysteries refute translation. That mystery is now ahead of her. Might as well go running and flush the chemical desire for the darkness with adrenaline, she thought. Page 104. Christina needed adrenaline to offset effects of upgraded metabolites of melatonin or serotonin jetting from her overactive pine cone, her first eye on a being still in the first place, an eye she kept out to James Corner and the dark man bearing down. Now she needed to charge up survival instincts. Moore hustled from the bridge back to his truck. He jumped inside for a break from the wind that wanted to dismember him for spending too much time suspended in the vortex between land and sea. He drove south across Chrissy Field and the Presidio on Doyle Drive. He sailed along the last open road running along Bay Waters before turning on to the trashy neon motel row of Lombard Street. Corner's house jutted out above the commercial chaos and crowds of tourists waiting for whatever is next on their agenda. He imagined his old amigo, Cohiba in hand, perched in his glass tower, surveying the harbor and the berths of the elite St. Francis Yacht Club. Missing to visit Darrow, he caught horns as he slowed to search for his street sign. He looked along Piercy Street into Cow Hollow, an area that hadn't seen any cattle grazing for 150 years. A block above Lombard, he found rows of white canvas fair pavilions. They were pitched in the middle of Union Street over several blocks. Parking, he walked around to check out the fair. Vans jammed the street as artisans unloaded wares from coats and silk hats, rustic furniture, photographs, jewelry, Tables laden with leather goods reeking of neat's wood oil alongside blown glassware mounted on recycled blast instruments. All the stuff you thought was cool when you bought it, but wonder about when you get it home. More importantly, at every intersection, food, beer, and wine stalls with open seating, kitty corner to those stalls, covered stages, thudded with crews setting up microphones and amplifiers for live music. The fair energy induced in him a craving to draw. Not that he was broke. He carried his pay in his pocket. He really needed to bleed off the bad grigri gathering from the fire. He just hoped it had not spread to Merrill's 10,000 acres of range and forest. How many paychecks would that be worth? Every dollar he carried over from one day to the next seemed like a thorn dragging on his freedom. Spend it on good times. Draw for more. Now, free from the dullness of sobriety, let the good old bad times roll. Yow, baby cakes! A young woman with bleach blonde hair frizzing around a headset passed by wearing a t shirt with a fair logo and crew in black letters across the shoulder. 
What's the bite for a space to draw portraits, he asked, stretching and rubbing his eyes with a wide yawn. 750 if I can squeeze you in. Most people reserved months ago. I'll pass. Have a good show. He flashed on the 200 in his pocket. Rich is up north, but barely enough for a dinner date in the city. Moore caught his reflection in the glass of a framed photograph of a cougar per crouched on a rock. He hoped he wouldn't have to draw anyone that rough looking. Picking up a piece of polished carved marble, he turned it in his hand to appreciate the labor. A silver-haired artist with a thick accent approached. That's Ansi an icon. Bring you much good luck, he said with a smile. Thanks, but I'd have to buy you out to change my luck, Moore replied. Oh, we could work something out, he offered with a wink. Moore laughed. Not wanting to take up any more of the man's time, he moved on to check out the paintings. The art had finesse, but most painters here cultivated the decorative market. Checking out numerous canvases, he found just the right subject motif and colors for the breakfast nook or over a couch in the living room. Art with a certain charm, and why not? Most folks were not borderline whack jobs like him, he thought with a shrug. Some booths were custom-made and included video monitors, track lighting, and streaming music for the total professional package. He felt poor by the moment. Then he nearly collided with a short man around his age, if better preserved, struggling with hardware to construct his homemade booth. A breeze played wispy hair as he bent to his task. Let me give you a hand, he offered, stepping over crates to hold the end of a galvanized pipe frame. The name is Dark, Darkmore, at your service. Johnny Sorensen, the man responded. His paintings were good-sized land seascapes, three to four feet by four to six feet, painted with a palette knife in thick, untempered colors. How about I help you set up here? I'll draw porches out front and get people to stop, check out your work. I'll kick back 25% of my take, Moore offered, reaching up to tighten a wing nut on Johnny's pipe frame. Sorensen, with a sideways smile, gave Moore a look like he was seeing him for the first time. His eyes were roomy, but not without humor. Why not, he replied as he slowly straightened. Get your easel and we see what happens. Bless you, Johnny. You won't regret it, he said as he finished tightening the last wing nut. He ducked out from the pipe frame, palms stained with iron rust, heavy bay fog rolling a chill down his spine. From his truck, he retrieved his box easel, folding chairs in a bag and a shoulder pack with a purse from the bridge. The little Swede hung his paintings. At one point, a gust whipped through, threatening to take him airborne as he carried a canvas arm stretched wide across its back. By 11 a.m., the sun burned through the fog as knots of shoppers and party-goers began to fill the street and sidewalk. He considered drawing in public a good distraction from her ghost haunting his private moments. Now Moore wondered just whose ghost was she. Somehow he felt Gina and Christina had merged in his heart into that one woman. Page 106. That one he'd been seeking to capture in pigment since the first day picking up a crayon. On the street, a crayon in his hand created a place with no strangers, offered a portal to his shared awareness between artist and victim. Moore set his chair to face the traffic flow. People strolled by, carefree, crippled, bouncing, dragging, and laughing and love and hate or high and low. They came craggy or creamy, bald or hair forever, but one thing they all shared in common. They all had a face. If only one a mother could love. Now, he found that fisherman's angle on catching one of those fish swimming past. How you folks doing? Moore asked a young couple as they strolled arm in arm. 
How about a sketch of your beautiful woman? I promise you a souvenir that you will cherish for as long as you like, he offered. The girl fell into her boyfriend's arms. They kissed. She leaned into him, her arms thrown loosely around his neck. Her blonde hair pulled into a tight bun showed dark roots down the back of her neck. Her form-fitting shades reflected his. They were dressed for jogging. He in full ash gray sweats and her in black string tank top and skimpy terry cloth shorts with white trim that set off tan sinewy legs. Moore observed the couple with calm amusement. The girl whispered something to her boyfriend, her lips playing on his. Finally, she glanced over at him. I don't know, I guess. Can you draw both of us together, she demurred with a smile. Don't know if I can fit all that love on one sheet of paper, he chided, catching the boyfriend's eye just to confirm who was in charge. This could be the start of a beautiful day for the rest of my life, he ventured to himself. He pulled the chair as closer, adjusted the angle of the drawing board before waving the couple to sit. From the easel box, he extracted several crayons of the darkest and richest colors. The lovers leaned into each other in a way more new must be captured. His hands started moving as he watched with one eye or two. Then every time he started, that panic of failure sunk in. The early days of his drawing in public often found him succumbing to this panic, once even walking away altogether. He'd learned as long as he managed to stay out of the way, the drawing almost unconsciously rolled out from there, hand merely following eye. The crayon drew on with line or shade. He blocked in some shapes, then let her rip as his eyes traced brows to cheekbones, sides of nose, corners of mouth, lips, chin, ears poking through hair, strands tossed in the wind. He left some passages grainy, slapping the paper with a chamois to create a soft, randomly blended effect on others. Drawing on for a few moments, he learned their names, Jim and Jenny. Sweethearts from Vallejo, they had moved to San Francisco to do the city scene until they were ready for the children that they promised not to name after him. They exchanged phone numbers after agreeing that drawing did create a bond, inviting him to visit their home to see the portrait hung proudly in their den. He knew they would never see each other again, but during the drawing he was as close to them as anyone in the life. In drawing he found the world whole, observer merged with observed. How did it get to so crazy otherwise, so broken, so shattered? He wondered, squeezing the needed rubber eraser for a clean edge to cut out highlights with one hand, while wielding crayon to deepen the shadow, hoping with rapid motion to capture the expression of the moment. In drawing, he appreciated blissful potential of a life well lived or poorly lived, or typically a bittersweet mix. This subtle, sublime joy in any sorrow eluded him as a carpenter. Sweat, blood, and screaming saws didn't lead to quiet introspection, although it did feel so good when you finished. Moore drew for hours, a mother and child, older woman, someone's teenage daughter, and a couple freebies. Catching a break in the afternoon, he decided to call Corner. He wanted to know if he'd heard from Christina. His hair was on fire for her, his heart knocking in his chest with thoughts of her. Feeling this way, he would never get enough of her. Thank the gods he could drink again. He went across the street to the blue light bar, whose neon glowing sign had tempted him since they opened. A barmaid in black skirt and low-cut blouse showing the tattoo of a dragon on her shoulder knifed through the crowd with a tray of tall drinks. Uh, where's the telephone? Moore asked, trying to keep eyes from sliding into her cleavage as she leaned over to deposit the drinks. Well, if it ain't in your pocket, it's in the back. Hey, I've been watching you out there. Want to do me? She asked with a giggle. She balanced a tray of empties on one hand as she cleared the table with the other. She snagged a cellophane wrapper and several cocktail napkins ringed with ice sweat before she turned back to him. 
Any time, my dear, any time, anywhere, he replied with a slight bow. Find me a spare Corona and a shot of tequila. I'll set it up on the bar, she promised, half his age and twice as sweet. No fool like an old fool, he thought. He headed to the men's room before making the call. When you find jubilation in a bar shitter, stinking of stale beer, cleaning fluids, and crude words scrawled on the walls, you know you're there, or where. He zipped up, dropped a quarter in the payphone, and dialed corner. The rings went unanswered till the voicemail kicked on. I'm drawing portraits at the Union Street Fair and drinking in the blue light, he held out the receiver to record the bar sounds. Join me or fuck off, or, and, go fuck yourself. He wandered through the face crowd, the air thick with aftershave and testosterone to find a long neck beer and shot waiting for him. Gunning the shot of tequila, he chased it with a few healthy slugs of the Corona. He watched the barmaid balancing a tray of tall Collins glasses packed with ice, sliced oranges, and candy cherries weave her way between the noisy drinkers. Moore walked over and dropped a folded $20 bill between the glasses. You want another? Later, I'm hungry to draw. Come on out on your break. If the easel is still there, I might. Her hair was bobbed short. A stray curl stuck to the perspiration on her forehead. Page 108. I don't get off till six, she pouted. Take me home, mine burned down. Then get back to work. She hoisted another tray of fresh drinks and spun into the crowd. Her stocking thighs slipped with a shush under the short black skirt. He drank the beer and returned to his easel. The sun that had poked out earlier, lost of the fog, with stiff gusts cutting along the street to snap against the canvas pavilions. Sorensen left his display uncovered rather than fight the wicked wind that had taken out a nearby blown glass display. Moore flipped up the collar of his heavy leather jacket. His hands clenched from the damp. The earlier fire he found in drawing was banked low. He felt dissipated in the chill air. People became a hindrance, their voices a terrible vacuous cacophony. Hey, mister, how much to make a picture of me and my mom? Moore turned, surprised he was still visible. The girl had large brown eyes, poised lips, and proud cheeks where strands of ebony hair danced across. Though she brushed back by slender fingers with lacquered nails, she wore hoop earrings and a sideways ball cap, her lips shone with silver gloss. How much, mister? she asked. Fifty bucks will keep me happy, he said, cracking knuckles and nodding at the mother. Her eyes smoldered above an engaging smile. Models and artists talked. Mother was Kwasanda Nzokia from the Sudan and her 14-year-old American-born daughter named Shalana. Kwasanda's accent softened the edges of her words. They had a melodic flow like a filmy liquid wrapping each sound. Do you have a studio, she asked, her hands stretching a black cotton scarf, electric with rows of jetting yellow arrows. Had one, until I accidentally torched it last night. Wasn't much more than orange crates and window panes, he replied without looking away from the drawing. He focused on Shalana first so she would be free to move around while he finished drawing her mother. Without a home, you come to the city. Kwasana said more as a statement than question. Yes, ma'am. Right now I'm living in my truck. Moore stretched the stiff muscles in his shoulders. He drew the daughter for 20 minutes before turning his attention to Kwasana. He knew the instant he started that she was checking him out. She seemed sympathetic, maybe too sympathetic, seeing too much into his soul. Night is too cold for your truck. Here's my telephone number. Without changing her position, she held out a black business card and the tips of her fingers. That's very kind, he replied. Shalana, scratching the back of her neck with lacquered nails, looked off somewhere beyond him. He kept drawing, his focus sliding from the pad to Kwasanda. Her eyes waited to take him home. 
They were open, and he flew on in. I have a friend who put me up. He's walking behind you, but don't worry. He's not as bad as he looks, he said, his corner loomed behind her with the collar of his leather coat turned up, hands jammed into his pockets. Quisana glanced over his shoulder. Her expression changed from open warmth to apprehension, communicating a warning. Moore held her eyes for a long moment, then signed the drawing. He has a mean shadow, she said, coming around the easel to look at the sketch. The portrait is very good. What do you think, Shalana? He draws souls. I love it. Corner spread his arms with a creak of leather. A man would have to be born blind to miss your beauty. He slouched against a lamppost, giving a slight bow. James Corner, and you are? Quisana Enzoki, I wonder what your game is about. Her voice took an edge that could be cut with a palette knife. I'm Shalana her daughter offered with enough attitude to make Moore want to kiss her. He could tell both women had read Corner's book, finding in the contents a warning of mayhem. Corner nodded to a beefy man standing to his left, hair buzz cut, brow beaded with sweat from carrying an extra 20 pounds. My associate, Mr. Aram Hashimi. His face, black peppered with today's beard, gave a cruel smile that took a licentious cast as he turned to Shalana. Care to join us for a drink? Our religion forbids alcohol, Kwasana managed to sound polite and insulting at the same time. Certainly didn't mean to offend, sugar. It's been a slice, Corner added with another slight bow. I'll make do with your artist here. Kwasana leaned closer to Moore. Call me, she whispered as she slipped money into his hand before running off to join her retreating daughter. He smelled the musk of her hair long after she was out of sight. Quick blasts of wind from the Pacific ripped through the Golden Gate and slashed at the pavilions. One not held down with sandbags lifted like a kite and crashed down on a woman selling candy popcorn. The fair was about over. Moore followed Corner into the blue light bar. The noise inside had gained momentum, walls thumping with drumbeat. Boozed up patrons slowed the trio's progress to the bar. Booming bass blocked out any but the most essential thoughts. Women shook and men posed. Hashimi knocked a drink from a barmaid's tray to spill on her cotton blouse, then tripped on a bar stool. He followed his misdeeds with a swagger and without apology, Talking with a tight grimace due to the cocaine, he snorted from the back of his fist. A man changes despite, or maybe in spite of himself. Page 110. Moore had watched the remnants of humanity fall from corner as he absorbed the meaner instincts of the company who kept him. Corner called for drinks with a smack on the bar. Nice tang sitting for Etch-a-Sketch. Nothing like a mother-daughter combo, my hairy man, Corner said as he chucked the backside of a flattened hand under Moore's chin. All women just tits and ass? How about a little soul there, brother, he replied, deadpan. Depends if you like your soul blackened or with white sauce. You're in love with the professor, you pussy whip motor scooter. I've seen this act before. Corner replied, cowboy boots perched on the polished brass rail and pulling on an earlobe. A toothpick pressed into the flesh of his lip. You're only a bad dream, Corner. You're not real. As real as your punk ass. Nice purse, by the way. Thinking of a gender change? Corner offered as he started to lift the bag from Moore's shoulder. Found it on the bridge this morning. Belongs to K.L., whoever she is, Moore said as he caught the strap in his fist. Ashimi pushed between the two men. Yak, fucking yak, like old women. Are we drinking or yakking? He glowered, throwing his shoulders back. Moore glared at the interruption. The fuck you looking at? You've been glassing me since we met. Corner's friend, don't make you mine. How old are you, Hash Man? Moore asked with exaggerated exhalation. I'd say 28 to 30, 
When I was that age, a pumped and coked up punk like you might have scared the shit out of me. But I grew up. Veins popped on Hashimi's neck as his jaw tightened. Easy, brother. Darkster stares at everybody. It's an artist thing. Don't take him personal, Corner interjected. He turned to the bar and offered a shot of tequila to Hashimi and another to Moore. I grew up in a world of baseball, hot dogs, and riding bikes in the park. That ended when JFK went down in Dallas. The dream died, and what's come out of my country since then are cycle killers like this man handing us our drinks, Moore said, taking the drink with a slight nod. Corner threw back his shot. Us cycles have always been around. Look at the pictures of Kennedy's assassination. The Secret Service didn't react when the first bullet hit him in the throat. The car stops and he takes a hit in the head. You tell me, who's doing the shooting? Who's doing the driving? It's obvious some agents were in on the takeover. Texas, LBJ, and Bell Helicopter me to Vietnam. I mean, come on. Take a good look around you, son. Good guys and bad guys don't mean nothing at the top. More fucking yak. Where I come from, my sister was gang raped by her husband's family for the sin of dropping her chalder in the marketplace. Keep your crayon rolling world, Hashimi growled, jabbing the back of a thin washed out blonde, causing her to spill a cherry red drink on her companion's proud clothes. Bastard! This shirt's harmonic, cost me two fifty. Hashimi grabbed the long neck bottle off the bar. Smashing it, he raked the man's cheek. Blood boiled out of the lacerations. The doorman rushed inside, biceps popping against a knit shirt, one size too small. Moore threw his weight into the crowd and felt silk slide under his hand. Moore corner crashed another long neck on the head of a ponytailed man and caught Hashimi to drag him outside. The doorman busied himself with separating the fighting patrons. Moore made his way to the street, the reverberating drum machine never missing a beat. He snapped together his easel, dropped the folded chairs in their bags, scooped up his pack, and fell in with Corner, who carried Hashimi by the collar. He let loose with a slight shove, and Hashimi did a quick shoulder roll. His eyes burned as he looked around. He walked to a table of fancy wrapped candy and flipped it with both hands. A blonde woman in tight Levi's and heels stood with both hands against her lips. Hashimi stepped on shattered glass and peanut brittle to pull her in close enough for his lapels to brush against her breasts. Christina's eyes twitched, going to a soft focus pouring over a plate of the copper scroll on her laptop. The archetypal form of the Hebrew letters had a phonetic structure akin to Sanskrit, where the form of the letters echoed their essential sound. Cymatics, she sighed, form as sound waves of everybody. A waves mean means meaning as any function of a funny action. Ma's Eve. L I function of communication, communicating what beyond the obvious, she now wondered. Communicating why as to whom? Why? Why your you in the first place, she now thought. A why you are out of it in her eyes, eye on everybody. A ma's world of any actuary. Her heart beat faster, staring at the letters hammered into the metal surface over 2,300 years ago. She now merged with the spirit of the scribe, imagining him, her, bent over the rare metallic 99% pure copper scroll with a wooden wall and stamp copying from a similar scroll already ancient at that time. Did you even know the language you copied, she wondered. The scroll of scrolls, transmitting a timeless vision, awareness, and a word freedom. ABCs of a being seen at attention, binary. I irradiating that indivisible cosmic black mirror sees. Now... A knowing out of it supernaturally is any thoughts and ABCs of a being seen still in the first place. Awareness of that promise, promising to set man as mind or why memory now free in a word freedom. Why not?
promises, promises, promettere, that at attention of a being seen, acknowledged now, still in the first place, merely mirrored, ask no, no, knowing it out as thoughts of it in denial, of it sent through, forth through the ages, through the pages. Awaken, awaken, Aten. Why you are a ten by now, ray I radiating. Page 112. Radiating it as thoughts of it now, projecting, ask no, no, knowing denial of a being seen still in the first place in a word freedom awareness of that indivisible invisibility. Now as cosmic being seen appearing out of it, mirrored in memory. Y'all merely appearing as thoughts out in denial of a being seen yet indivisible invisibility of it now, she mused. Ah, knowing of a being seen hammered into a medium of such purity as to make it nearly the most impervious to decay. Only gold would be more so, yet gold would be far less impervious to greed. Once rediscovered, a golden scroll would likely have been melted down for its mere monetary value. The timeless, priceless value of its revelation for y'all mankind lost for pennies on a dollar. And now, what of that? A why I revelation of merely appearing, a gazing it, she wondered. Is it time? Are people ready? Is there a value for it? Certainly the world had witnessed unprecedented global suffering and genocidal carnage in the 20th century. Was it enough to bring y'all ma's children around to finally are y'all izing a why? A why? A why of such suffering in the first place? Suffering merely as thoughts of a goddess? Literally, y'all, it, hardwired neurologically in any hard-felt feeling field of view. Of you or a Y-I of a being seen still in the first place. Was Warren's scheme necessary to complete the real mission of the scroll? Somehow she found in herself a memory brought forth to avert his global annihilation. A memory in her eyes of everybody, of a being seen now as a wave. Mean. Means meaningful, ask knowing out of falling as leap on or off that. Ask knowledge. Ach, knowledge of y'all, a being seen now out of it, that first place merely as leap into or out of a black around, asking of it why, ask knowing, a being seen a gain, a beginning of it. Christina thought of her teacher, her acharya, Shiv Shankarji, a flash and blood firmament of ancient knowledge of a being seen merely appearing to disappear, a being seen a dwaita, of a singular indivisible point of view, of you, of why, of a why I, of that, that I am merely appearing, a gazing it. She now still marveled that y'all his books were committed completely to memory, of a being completely absorbed now in any inward, ask knowing denial of it as that appearing information, anybody, anything, anytime, anywhere of such a being seen now out of it turning a black around, echoing any knowing denial of it merged with and emerging still a being beaming on or off as that ask knowledge. Then as any thoughts of it supernaturally, of course, are y'all eyesing that ask knowing out of it in her eye of everybody. As any appearing of it by... Ach, no, no, knowing out of it, ABC's information in words as wild DNA. A denial of A being still in the first place, that indivisible invisibility now out 
in toward of that singular twisting information of fate, faith, or family. A denial of it while DNA. Denial as in toward a twisting into turning out of intention of intentional disregard of a being seen still. Now that as cosmic indivisible invisibility of a being seen asking of it why any knowing out of it as thoughts of it information. Letterly, y'all, information in word. In Shiva G's revelation, she found you all in her eyes, leap heretofore any scholarship completely upended, turned invisibility at black around. After all, y'all, why, for what purpose had she now been turning about, ask no, no, knowing out of it while searching for it in those myriad untold hours, merely mirroring herself? She now found herself lost in a mirror mind, completely blown up, shattered, laying in tatters y'all around. A city of the gods, literally y'all, as words, concepts, syntax, now laying in ruin of a black around her eyes, as Kalima's evil. Yet, she now remains still, unperturbed, in a Pasai hole center, a naked invisibility heart of the complete darkness, the total encirclement of a being seen, point of view of you of why of a why I appearing and gazing it in the first place, a why now out of it merely mirrored in toward a Pasai hole potential, a zany thoughts of it in toward a twisting in two appearing a pairing of it, as to twisting out now merely a while, a pairing as existing in any mirror image. The ruined city of thoughts, of thoughts, of a God, as say to be literally all, merely falling apart, black as leap, black into one indivisible invisibility of any individual, of a consciousness, a hard con, she, us, now essay to be as anybody, etc. Letterly, all as hard felt field of a mirror sees a ray reflecting out in her eyes of a mercy, a while of mercy or indifference, a denatural out indifference to it as anybody now ignoring it. Or I of her him it as a why I stare I way. Her him it I stare I or why as exiting, duplicating any duplicity of it a while, playing out as existing information merely supernaturally, as thoughts in any mirror mind or why nah you knee verse. Y'all got to be way too happy being ignorant to be indifferent to the supreme supernature of it out in her eyes as any thoughts of anybody, any thinking of it, any time, anywhere. She now found in her eyes a eye ray stare, eye playing out, a why of it playing as X edding, a duplicating her eyes, eye on that indivisible black body quantum black around. Of it as curving, turning, churning, yearning, now out in, as knowing out of it electromagnetic loops. E loopy loops under the gravity. The wait, the waiting for that loop to end, naturally where it begins as cause microwave black around. Exit a black. Exit a black, appearing information a while, while DNA with now potential to peer out again. Any denial of it, now, then, the end, ending of it, fade back to that a black as cause all body of everybody, appearing, disappearing in complete the darkness of E loops, a ma rig around, she not laugh till tears stream cheeks. Except now, in the presence of her guru, Shiv Shankara, she no longer waited, was no longer waited by the inward mirror, city still turning, learning, burning that black around, 
had like a rounding out in her eyes, in her eyes a blood of his blood, in her eyes Zion a being seen merely in his appearing, gazing it out as X, y'all. The plasmic, the arcaning city flowed merely as sees a microwave black around of a being seen of Y as X in Ariel out in her eyes as in zinging it out a mare go round Ivre body of her him it as Horizani I on a line between betwixt that as cosmic being to perceive to see to think as anybody mirrored in words supernaturally y'all as any thoughts of a why now as to nothing to nothing as anything as a positive denial as knowing out of it e rate thing why not now a great being seen awareness of shiv shankaracharya creator sustainer destroyer of you all that still a being seeing a why i appearing gazing at invisibility appearing anybody by a Y mirror, black mirror, supernatural, see as potential, with intention, superimposed as thoughts in formation, yet indivisible in a being seen, a Y I her him it, as our I veiled in that singularity of our I all ization of a Y being. A Y being that yod, that iota, that I in, I am, is, is. Is Isis Mare playing her ways of Eve, her waves of pure mirror function, still functioning, swimming now in shark-infested waters where the big ones eat the little ones. She now was not looking to checking into any cave. A while may continue now knowing it, yet she had just in time slipped the bonds of inward ignorance of a no, no, knowing out of herself any why not me without, as existing still, are y'all eyes singing a why. She now, as any mere supernatural thoughts of a being still in the first place, a ray turned to a race within her eyes on fellow rats. Christina knew there was speculation of a more intimate relationship with her teacher. That really cracked her up. She had found herself a mere dust mode in the galactic seas, consciousness of his awareness, of a being seen still in the first place. Still, she would not have ruled out sex, but her study, meditation, and seva, or service, left no time, let alone the energy, for that desire. Her guru caused to be organized and fundraised a K-12 through school for some 5,000 native students. That was his seva beyond his function of enlightening any who came to his door, and many came to his door. So many that often he would take up his robe, walking stick and bowl, walking out in different directions, buffeted hither and yon upon her eye waves. She was mere melted butter at his feet. The journey to the east had been hard on her body. Few knew how close she had come to a real psychic and biological disintegration. The scintillating electric fire of his Brahmavidyam, awareness of any knowing of it now, a not knowing denial of it, burned away the dross of y'all that matters. It really sizzled your grits, she mused. Christina drew knew a death in India in the presence of her guru, more profound, more complete than any physical death. In her eye now, the wait was over moment by moment. Ask knowing of no, no knowing out of it, a mere denying of herself. She now was released now and forever, from falling understanding its inward spelling as any thoughts of it, or still a why I now, now appearing, a gazing at it. 
the mirror see that indivisible invisibility pond of it in her eye projecting ahead behind above below to the right to the left y'all around offered infinite potential as x y'all as sex she laughed at the way her mind wandered like an electron to a positron like the lips of lovers coming back around to primal desire the fact was she had nearly burned out the shock to her system from jerusalem from rape and murder caused near complete disintegration as it was what appeared solid in dark's eye of desire was already ash appearing intact but crumbling at the touch she now knew the tragic irony of love should one be loved or be loved why the desire for the body of a man and a woman of knowledge why is the sky blue she might ask the answer would be very similar it isn't and it still isn't christina changed into her running clothes and ran she ran hard but still tasted the darkness as her blood pulsed endorphins flooded feet pounded as knees churned to clear the linguistics from her head her work had taken her around the world once speaking in front of 10,000 in Bombay. Career was not enough. Christina yearned for a relationship with a man where mind stirred body and mind aroused body aroused body. Darkmore was an obvious wrong choice. She now still tasted his lips. Corner flipped the lid on his vibrating cell phone. The name R.W. McCracken lit up the screen. He didn't know what the W stood for, but he gave McCracken the nickname Whip for his ambition and proclivity to S&M. McCracken should know better than squeezing his authority through the cell phone to try intimidating Coroner. The mayor is not going to be happy when he finds out we tossed his girlfriend from the bridge. You sure he has a purse? McCracken's voice boomed. Corner could hear him smacking his wooden fertility totem against an open palm. Initials and all, she called it her giggle bag, stuffed with poppers and a dildo for nights with the mayor. Kiowa had it with her the night I was at Zenith for a three-way. Why didn't you grab the damn thing when you had the chance, McCracken demanded, the heat from the self-inflicted blows reddening his voice. Fuckhead, Ashimi started knocking heads and I lost more in the shovel. Not to worry, he'll show up. He wants a certain lady's number. Get that bag. I want the tracks covered. Corner slipped the phone into an inside pocket and tapped the colt nestled under his armpit. Whip might own the portal, his Menlo Park Labs with a syndicate and all, but he didn't own him. McCracken people jumped too around him. Corner wanted to jump in with the taste of the pain Whip liked to inflict on the weaker sex. He had to admit that McCracken was a wily, cunning son of a bitch. He had turned decades of public funding for the Human Genome Project into patent laws to privatize, develop, and control the new genetic-based technology. Corner collected a double paycheck, one in Johnstone Warren Services' higher hand, the other from a Kraken for a touch of industrial espionage and solving unsolvable problems like Kiowa Larson. Man gets the job done, then gets his thong in a wad when the overwrought woman suddenly takes her own life. He snuffed through his nose, threw back his shoulders and combed fingers through his hair. He detected a faint sulfurous taste in the back of his mouth. The green beast hovered his periphery. A shadow just beyond, no matter how quickly he turned. Or he might come through a dream appearing in Corner's face, yammering at him, showing his grotesque physique, pinning Corner with his eyes, freezing him with his will. You're mine, he'd harangue. You sold your Yankee soul to me, he'd chide through blood-stained teeth. Then he'd turn his back and walk away, carrying a bullet-riddled, desiccated corpse. Corner would know the wounds. He would recognize the bullet-riddled, torn face, the smile of one with flesh and muscle shot away from corners of the mouth. War without end, he thought. 
despite years walking on, while some, like Darky Man, seem so sheltered in safe harbors. He felt a certain kinship with Kyle Larson. She had weathered her share of storms. Page 116. Ambitious, the mayor's girlfriend, assisted, assistant director of Messing's West Coast Research and Development Division, she was capable of shedding blood to protect her turf. In a late-night card game, she revealed finding large amounts of money siphoned off for a certain project. She had downloaded the files, but then tried to play corner against McCracken by holding out the disc. He called her out. They struggled on the bridge, her silk dress and panties sliding over the flesh of her thigh and buttocks as they struggled, he remembered. Killing the woman? No. She jumped after he let her go. Her scream as she fell was triumphal. Finally, she was free of possession. Like Darky Man said, it's only a dream and a scheme. Corner's main concern remained his own survival. The green beast wouldn't let him slip away that easy, he thought. Whenever feeling free, cold fingers squeezed his guts till bowels and bladder emptied like his, in his first kill. Liquefied by the pressure of blood released under fire, fire from his hand, ripping flesh from bare legs of a barefoot man in black silk pajamas. Everyone has someone and some place to go. His was with a company of ghouls led by a shape-shifting lizard with yellow teeth. With copper scroll gold and certain desperately sought-after papyri in his hand, he hoped to buy a respite from this cursed demon parlayed by Christina Shaughnessy's other world influence, maybe even start his own dynasty. <laughs>